Good evening, church. Uh, Tonight's Bible reading will be from 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, 1 to 11. Now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly, as labour pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. This is God's word. think that the idea is that next week that machine will be able to do the sermon as well. Is that the plan? (laughs) Sounds good. I'm going to give you a moment just to gather each other in and say hello and maybe even make a good friend. Can you do that now? Am I? Oh, I've got to click it. Thanks. Sometimes when you're flicking through the photos on your phone or in the old family album, the camera angle is such that whoever it is you're looking at, maybe yourself, or it just, you look different. There's a really, there's an unusual aspect to what I'm seeing in this camera angle, and this is a picture of you from an unusual angle. It's kind of low resolution. Can you see it? There's boxes. There's 52 down and 83 across. It's your average life in weeks. So one box for every week of your life if you live a statistical life. So me, I'm about there. Near the top like you, we're all up the top. But I'm, I'm about there, about two-thirds the way along. How about you? Where are you up to? Pretty spooky to think that COVID just shredded three of those columns. That blur of COVID that happened where time scales warped and there was my life before COVID and now my life afterwards and I... Yet three of those columns just boof. What 
we're not around very long, are we? These short lives that we live. Last week, I was showing us a beautiful promise that is yours in Jesus, that he has won for you by his death and resurrection. The promise that for us, death is not the end, it's a veil. And on the other side of that is absolute certainty. The apostle says it's as though we will sleep You won't know the passing of eons. He will appoint a day where in his wisdom your life will end. And I don't know if you've got that many boxes. This is not an entitlement, is it? But I do know that on the other side of that veil, these boxes and the pain and frustration they each contain will melt away. Compared to the vastness, the richness, and in the unending, beautiful quality of what we are destined to enjoy with him. Uh, That song we just sang just had me tearing up with the majesty and the glory of what is ours in Jesus. Certainty beyond death. So tonight, I just want to complete a picture for you. Because in the back of my mind, I'm worried. In the back of my mind, you are concerned as well that maybe it will not be so for me. That after all, I might be found as one who does not belong in that eternity. And so I need to help you and I need to help my heart today to be absolutely certain about the end what will happen and what will not happen to you if you are in Jesus. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. Think of it like darkness, says the apostle. He says, brothers, sisters, about times and dates we don't need to write to you for you know very well The day of the Lord, that's the end, will come like a thief in the night. People will be saying, peace, safety, but destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. My background is physics. I taught at Camden High for a while, if you've had any connection there, and in London. And physics is a fascinating field because it's just so desperate at the moment. Physics is desperate for a breakthrough. Because at the moment, physicists are breaking all of the rules about what scientists ought and ought not do. The golden rule of science is that you don't hold on to theories that are dead. A theory is just a theory. And if it's got no evidence to back it up, that's all it can ever be. You can't proclaim it as fact. To this day, science has no explanation as to how Everything came out of nothing. You've heard of Big Bang Theory. We've got lots of mathematics and physical models to describe milliseconds, microseconds, 
infinitesimally small seconds of time after a Big Bang. And all sorts of theories about how the incredibly complex and beautiful universe we see today might have arranged itself out of the chaos of that bang. But science has absolutely zero explanation for anything before that. How does nothing bang into everything? Now, the best a scientist can do is write a popular novel and philosophize. At that point, they're not being a scientist. There is no science for that question. And so physics has been in a quandary through the 1950s and 60s as our understanding of the universal constants got more and more intricate and precise and we started to realize just how complicated subatomic matter is. You remember year eight physics, science, you start chopping atoms and what do you find? Electrons, protons, neutrons. We thought that was mind-blowing a hundred years ago. Now we're chopping these up and finding gluons and quarks and mesons and all these strange exotic things that you only get to see when you explode particles together in particle accelerators. Have I lost you? All of that complexity incredibly complex and it should be an utter goop of chaos but it's not. Every day staring back in the mirror is an exquisitely beautiful marvelously miraculous Miracle. This whole planet. And you know how desperate they are to search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI. Why are they so desperate? Because it can't be so. We have to find more of it to show that it's not a miracle. It's something that happens in a chaotic universe when little eddies of chaos turn back on themselves and make moments of order. But that's all they are, just little whirlwinds of mirage in an utterly chaotic universe. They are desperate to hear something, please, that says, no, we are not alone. Now, I have no opinion on whether we will find extraterrestrial intelligence or not. My God is a clever God. But the desperation is there. Because how else could it be? Or take, for example, all of those physical constants. These are the magic numbers, if you like, the ratios that relate the various bits and pieces of the physical universe together, like the velocity of light. You've heard of that one? Well, there are all these physical content, constants. We won't go into it now. But it's almost as though the dials of the universe have been incredibly, perfectly set so that life would happen on this planet. I won't go into it now, you've read these sorts of things, but it's incredible, the precision. I'll say it again, there is no scientific explanation for how nothing could possibly turn into everything, and particularly the everything that we see around us and the most extraordinary piece of something that is sitting next to you tonight. And there's almost no one who walks this planet as though it is an utter chaotic accident. Even your friends, it's become very trendy to claim atheism now. They're not really atheists, they're agnostics. It's very rare to find a true atheist a true atheist believes there is absolutely no meaning, purpose, intentionality to anything at all, and there's no difference in the end between your grandmother and a piece of seaweed in the Atlantic. And there ought to be no difference in how you treat them. No difference between a cockroach and your boss at work. 
But that is not how anyone lives. No one looks in the mirror that way. No one drives through traffic that way. No one lives an atheist life. It's most unlivable, trust me. Now, most of your friends who are claiming that very convenient title of atheism are really practicing agnosticism, which is, I don't know and I don't want to know. And if you push them in conversation, that's where you might be able to help them realize that. And it's actually, for most people, it's a preference. I prefer atheism as a way of seeing the world. A godless explanation for the world is my preference. They won't have any evidence for it. Curious, that, isn't it? I just want to encourage you with this because in movie land, right, we are told every week that we're so certain of everything that science has got it all sorted out. Have you heard of the parallel universes that are popping up in all of the movies now? Just about every Marvel movie has parallel universes. We've got parallel Spider-Man now. Have you seen this? Right? That's the working assumption. Parallel universes. Do you know where that comes from? 1980s, string theory. Again, physics is so desperate to try and explain this unexplainable universe that we are grasping at straws. This is where physics is up to. So until the 1980s, we were describing mathematically all of the particles of the universe as points in space, and you can define your mathematics in terms of little points in space interacting with other points. But someone came up with the idea that instead of mathematically treating all of the particles of the universe as points in space, treat them as lines, wiggling lines, hence strings. Okay, now don't worry about the, physics, the physicality of how that could be. Just understand that the mathematics kind of works. You can explain uh, interactions between things and forces in terms of these strings. But there's one cool thing about string theory is that it produces mathematically the possibility of parallel universes. So multiple solutions to the same equation, if you like. Hence parallel possibilities. Now that was in the 1980s, string theory. Where are we up to now? Okay, we're four decades on, and how much evidence has turned up for string theory? Zip. Right? None. But string theory, we so desperately want it to be true in the world of physics because that gives us parallel universes and gives us a beautiful solution to this awkward feeling that maybe we are in a created universe that is extraordinarily special. But if there's parallel universes, oh, well, there you go. There's as many universes as you want, and we just happen to be in this fluke. Do you see how it works? Oh. When before in science... Have we allowed a theory to have so much sway? Throughout the last three decades, you could not get a PhD in physics if you didn't subscribe to, if you don't subscribe to string theory. So much so has it become the dominant, please let it be true, paradigm for an academic world that is meant to be based on evidence. The scriptures say, God. It's God who makes everything out of nothing and makes it so that such an extraordinary sample of something meaningful and significant and valuable and precious is looking back at me in the mirror and looking back at you. And deep down you know it. Deep down your friends know it. There is meaning. There is truth. And there is wrong, there is light, and there is darkness. All of this comes from a theistic view of the universe. None of it can come from atheism. Does this make any sense? I just want to give you some of the logical guts behind the confidence of Scripture in a place 
here, like 1 Thessalonians 5, that says, the day of the Lord is going to come. Why? It has to. Think of it as the pillars of absolute reality, beginning with the certainty of creation. God has made all of this. So all of this is answerable back to him. You can't run around pushing God away without consequence. It's wicked. Second pillar, Jesus Christ has come, God in the flesh, and we nailed him to a tree. That day sealed the certainty. If God must surely come to reconcile his creation that he made, how much more will he come and reconcile his creation and reckon with the wickedness of his creation? Who would kill its own creator? The moment Jesus died is the moment the absolute certainty of the final day is locked in. Judgment must come. It cannot be other. The creation God made cannot run away for him forever. The creatures that crucified their God cannot go unpunished. The end will come. Sometimes you see on TV the detonation of an old building. They like to show this in the last five minutes of the news bulletin because it's positive and fun and people like seeing that little moment. You know, the old derelict building and 1098, the countdown, and suddenly you see puffs of smoke all up and down the side of the building. You know this footage, you've seen it, and then a weird thing happens. For a split second, the building just hangs in midair, doesn't it? That's the days we're in now. Days that should not be happening. The Old Testament looked forward to the day of the Lord, a day of reckoning. Where God's going to come and make everything right and get rid of wickedness and evil. Bang! That's the Old Testament looking forward. The day of the Lord will come. All the prophets are saying, the day of the Lord is coming. In the New Testament, we discover an extraordinary development. The day of the Lord is not a moment, but an extraordinary stretched out time of impossible days that shouldn't be happening. The day of the Lord began with the coming of Jesus and it will end with his second coming. And these impossible days that ought not to be happening, the days between when the Son of God was crucified by his own creatures and judgment should have fallen right then on us all. The Son comes up again. Impossibly. If the sun comes up tomorrow, it will be by a miracle of God's grace. As he holds back a hand of judgment and extends a hand of incredible mercy, days that should not be happening so that precious ones can be called to him in grace. But this hand of judgment must fall as surely as that building will collapse. The detonations already happened. That's why I show you the boxes on the screen. Our days feel so long, our lives feel so endless, we think we've got so much, but they're not, they're a flash. And the scriptures say world history is like that. A thousand years? It's like a day to the Lord. And so we are living in a world with the lights switched off. Darkness has come. The darkness of sin and unbelief, that arrogant, I don't want you, God, that wave the atheist flag, that preference to live without God, has brought an utter darkness onto humanity. A nighttime, if you like. And in that darkness, 
those who have pushed God away will not see it come. That's why the apostle here uses the language of a thief coming in the night. You see it in verse 2. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, peace, safety, just like they did in the Old Testament when the prophets were saying, there's a judgment coming. And the false prophets would say, no, there's no judgment. God is not angry. Jerusalem's fine. What are you so worried about? Our culture says, God is not angry. There's no judgment. Your life is fine. What are you worried about? There's no sin. There's no hell. And verse 3, destruction. Suddenly, just like labor pains mean the baby's coming. There is no turning back now. What I want to tell you tonight that this is the tragedy of our lost world, but it is not you. It's not me. This is not a description of us who are in Christ Jesus. Be absolutely sure of this. Look at verse 4. Read who you are in verse 4. Brothers, sisters, you are not in darkness. That day is not going to surprise you because you're a child of light. You're living in the day. You can see it all because you can see what God has shown you in the gospel. Yes, there is a judgment coming, but it's not going to catch you out. You don't need to fear judgment. It won't be like that thief when you don't know that they're going to turn up. We can see exactly what is happening. We don't know the day or the hour, but we can see the end as clearly as ever. As clearly as the resurrected Jesus. Verse 5, you are children of light. Children of the day. We don't belong to the night or to the darkness. So let's not be like them. And at this point, the apostle, who's been using this beautiful analogy of sleep in the previous paragraphs to describe the way a Christian goes into death and then wakes on that last day and doesn't experience the millenniums in between. And now he switches this language of sleep to describe those who are caught out in darkness and unready for Jesus. He says, verse 6, don't be like them who are asleep. Let's be awake, right? Sober. Those who sleep, they sleep at night. They get drunk, drunk at night. But we belong to the day. Let's be sober. Put on faith and love as a breastplate, the hope of salvation as a helmet. Very helpful image, isn't it? Drunkenness and darkness. What is the mentality of getting drunk? This isn't a text about alcohol. This is a text about horizons. Getting drunk is all about who cares what happens tomorrow. I'm in the moment now. And yes, I'm going to go for it. Thank you. I'll have another one. And I might be drunk on alcohol because I'm not thinking about how I'm going to feel in the morning or whether I'll be able to turn up for work or what this will mean for my family or what will, the, what will be the outcome of turning home drunk and violent or whatever alcohol does to me. You see, drunkenness is about forget the true horizon, just live in the moment of now and the pleasure of whatever it is in front of me and I dive in and you might be drunk on your career. You might be drunk on money-making. You might be drunk on obsessing with relationships, 
finding the girlfriend or having the boyfriend or whatever it is, it is about now. And I'm going to throw myself into it and I don't really care what the big consequence is. I'm not looking beyond, I'm just here for the now. That's worldliness, isn't it? Eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. But we are children of the light. Through the gospel, we can see clearly the far horizon of the end. Because we're standing in that light of the gospel. And so we want to be ready for that horizon. And so we stand in verse 7. This is you, Christian. This is me. I'm in verse 7. Where am I standing? I'm standing in my identity that Jesus has won for me. This sure promise of the gospel. See that helmet is guarding my head. <laughs> that helmet of salvation won by him. I'm loved. I'm secure. I don't need to get drunk on this thing in front of me now to feel okay about myself, to feel significant in the world, to try and keep other people. That's not my identity. Look at me in Christ. This helmet of salvation. And look at me get dressed each day in the armor of that identity, the outcome of that identity, this faith and love. Faith, which is about my vertical rightness with God and love, which is about my horizontal overflow of that identity into the world and how I treat people. This is how we walk in the world. What a wonderful way to live the rest of your little boxes. Don't you think? What a wonderful way to wake up in every one of those boxes the Lord gives you, knowing who you are, seeing the end clearly. Nothing's going to surprise us. Not afraid or fearful as death approaches. And not aimlessly throwing myself into whatever pops up in front of me like some drunken fool in the dark. No. Love. Faith. That's what I do today. Wow. And the apostle says... In verse 9, this is the whole point of the gospel. Look at this. God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, and now he's switched the language back to whether you're still living when Jesus returns or you've fallen asleep into death, whether you're awake or asleep, right? You're going to live together with him. So encourage one another, build each other up, just as you're doing. Friend, you cannot possibly face the judgment of God on the last day. You cannot possibly face the judgment of God on that last day. If you are a believer in Jesus... Then verse 9 says to you, God has a plan. And it is not judgment. Absolute certainty. You will receive salvation through the Lord Jesus. Appointed, not by any merit of your own, but by Jesus. See verse 10? That's why he died. He went to that cross so that you could wake up on the other side of that curtain and not suffer wrath. This is the great hope at the center of the Christian faith. He died for us so that we can live together with him. So if I click this slide again and now Camera workers do a little trick. Oh, what's that now? What's that? That's how many lifetimes it's been 
not generations, but lifetimes, average nowadays lifetimes, put end to end since Jesus. You got that? That's all. About 23, 23 lifetimes since Jesus. That's not very long, is it? Don't ever be tricked into thinking that Jesus is not coming back because it's taken so long. Every day is a beautiful miracle of his grace, but it will happen. It has to happen in God's physical universe that he made. He put the gluons together and the quarks. He's the one that understands gravity. And the gravity of this universe means Jesus must come back. There will be a judgment, and you are appointed to not suffer that judgment, but to inherit eternal life. I'm going to pray for us. Lord, thank you so much for such a wonderful gospel truth. To know for sure that the end will come and that when it comes, there will be no surprise. You will not catch us out. You won't change the game. You are instead holding out for us and holding ready for us an eternal life that no one can take away. Lord of this physical universe who made such a beautiful creation, if you can make this, then how much more can you make the new world? How much more can you make eternal life? Lord, bring that day, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.